Stories of Futures Past presents Five Stories Featuring Alien Aliens A Time of Cold by Mary Carlson Reluctant Genius by Henry Slezar Shandy by Ron Goulart Lonesome Hearts by R. R. Winterbotham All Cats Are Grey by Andre Norton The Time of Cold by Mary Carlson Originally published in Worlds of If Science Fiction, September 1963 Narrated by Tom Trissel. Kurt felt the airship going out of control as he passed over a rock-splattered stretch of sand. Automatically he looked for a smooth place to land and steered the bucking ship for it. The jolt of the landing triggered the ejector seat, and in a second he was hurtling through the air away from the explosion of the damaged vehicle. Just before he blacked out, he thought, almost calmly, a good hundred and fifty miles from the colony. When he regained consciousness, night was passing, and the first of the three suns was peeking over the horizon. Kurt lay still for a while, afraid to find out what might be wrong with him, and the rescue ship could take anything from an hour to a week to find him. He moved his head to discover if there might be anything left of his ship. He saw nothing but pieces. Well, he said aloud, so much for that. He reached back gingerly and undid the seat straps. Carefully he sat up and began to ease his weight onto his feet. A sharp twinge of pain in his knee dropped him back to a sitting position. He probed at the knee, but found no broken bones. Well, he said again, quietly, the colony leaders had had very little to offer in the way of survival. Rule number one, mark the crash site and your direction of travel. Number two, get into shade before the combined heat of the three suns boils your blood. Number three, carry your pistol for protection against liquid scorpions and always save the last pellet for yourself. Kurt glanced around nervously at the thought of the liquid scorpions, the one form of animal life the colonist had found on this mineral-rich planet. Liquid scorpions were enormous masses of clear, jellyish liquid that oozed forward across the rock and sand with remarkable speed. A liquid scorpion changed shape constantly, its mass shooting out legs whenever they were needed. Only the eyes, fixed in a bulge over the centre of its mass, and the almost solid, curved stinger that arched over its back remained the same. The first landing party had stood transfixed while one of the crew was attacked and absorbed before their eyes. Clear, the scorpion had been almost invisible to them until it flowed about the navigator's legs and paralysed him with a swaying stinger. When his frantic struggles had ceased, the creature flowed over his body and absorbed it. As the party watched, the clearness slowly became a thin dark red and the body could no longer be seen. Avengers had poured out of the ship after the giant scorpion, which reared back, tripling its height and halving its width. At the apex, the true protruding eyes bulged at them, and the stinger swayed back and forth, reaching out and retreating. Explosive pellets fired into its flesh were absorbed with a slurping sound. The captain, in the end, had knelt and taken careful aim at the right eye, behind which was the only unreddened sector of the mass. When the right eye disappeared, the clear area spurted out of the hole and drained over the jelly-like surface. Slowly, silently, the first of the liquid scorpions died. Kurt counted the pellets in his belt, an even hundred. Enough. If he managed to keep out of sight, 
and had good enough aim. He surveyed the surrounding countryside. Farther along the valley were shaded caves where he could find protection once he had marked his course. If he could walk that far. Zen came sluggishly awake, feeling the warmth penetrate his mass. The time of heat had come again, the time to search for what would halt the hunger that ached through every inch of him. Slowly, his cold, stiffened mass flowed forward from its hiding place in the warmth holding sand. The heat melted the stiffness out of him, and he began to slide across the sand, his alert senses functioning again. Sense of touch led him across rocks and over ridges easily. The touchy sense of vibration waited apprehensively for movement that would shake the ground. And the third sense, the one that could be called only sense, or sense of knowing, functioned as always without his understanding. Today, this third sense told Zen was different from other days. Extra cautious, Zen oozed over rocky barriers in the direction that his sense had told him held food. Once he felt a slight tremor, and in terror flooded out over the rock into thin, transparent nothing. He waited several degrees of heat, but no further movement touched the sensitive receivers in his mass. A falling rock, he decided. Collecting himself and starting forward again, he slithered down rocky walls, pouring almost like water when the drop was long and drawing together at the bottom. When his feeling of touch warned him of the shade whose coolness might solidify him and leave him helpless in the open, he drew hurriedly away and changed direction. Finally, he reached an open spot that was likely to contain food. His mass ached for something to consume, but he flooded himself thin again and waited, feeling. There was no vibration through the surface, nor did his sense tell him of anything other than the possibility of nourishment. Zen hesitated only a degree of heat before bubbling excitedly into the open space. Touch found him something edible almost immediately. He flowed around and over it, absorbing it hungrily. His mass dissolved it almost immediately and ached for more. He slid thin, reaching out in every direction until contact was made, then absorbing the food instantly and moving on. Kurt, lying in meagre shade that would be gone in half an hour when the third and largest sun rose, first saw the movement when it was on the rocks. His already frayed nerves gave a frightened leap. He lay perfectly still, where he had seen the movement on the rocky shelf there was now nothing. The nothing moved forward. Kurt shivered. He was certain he was seeing nothing, and yet his eyes were trying to tell him there was movement. When it reached the flat place and flowed swiftly forward, he realized that it was a liquid animal and was suddenly pointedly conscious of the weight of the pistol against his hip. He watched carefully for the eyes and the stinger, but saw none. That frightened him. If he could not find the brain, he had no mark to shoot at. As he watched, the liquid creature flowed against one of the hardy sun-browned plants and jerked in reaction. Instantly it flowed over the plant and absorbed it. The liquid turned momentarily a thin brownish-green and then cleared again. Kurt watched it with narrowed eyes. It was just possible that this creature ate only plant life. The colonists had realised that the liquid scorpions had fed upon something else before they arrived, but no one had been able to discover what that something was. Zen was in the process of absorbing a plant when the vibration sense alerted him. Terror shot through him and he spread thinly across thirty feet of ground and lay motionless his sense telling him frantically that a sting was hunting nearby. He lay for many degrees of heat, waiting. Sense of vibration and knowing 
Both told him that the sting was approaching, but uncertainly searching. Then both senses reacted startedly to a new danger on the other side, new movement, a new feeling that his sense could not understand. The sting was approaching at an angle that would inevitably bring it into contact with Zen. Absorption was a penalty for being caught. Zen was resigned to death, for he could not possibly escape the sting. And now there was this new sensation on the other side of him. Whatever it was, he had no idea. But likely it was as voracious as the sting. Now the new thing vibrated jerkily around him, and stopped between him and the sting. The vibrations from the eager sting accelerated rapidly, eagerly, as it flowed over the ground. Then, for no reason except that the new creature had moved slightly, the sting recoiled. The jerks were plainly recorded through the earth to Zen, and as he felt the heavy jar, his sense told him that the danger from the sting was past. The sting was dead. Zen drew himself together and considered that. The new thing vibrated jerkily, the place from which Zen had first felt it move. It must be solid as the rocks to move so jerkily, Zen thought. The sting killer drew itself back under the enormous rock and ceased to move. Curiosity drew Zen forward. Fear dragged him back. He spread thin and drew together with uncertainty. At last he oozed forward carefully until he reached the rock. The sting killer was pressed back under the rock, where touch told Zen a tiny amount of the cold carrying shade remained. Zen puzzled at that. Why should this creature hide from the life-giving suns? He reached out and absorbed a plant thoughtfully. This thing was different from the liquid structures he had always known. If it was solid, where they were liquid, perhaps then it was also opposite in its needs. Maybe this sting killer needed cold instead of heat. While Zen was considering this difficult thought, the sting killer began to move again. Kurt gasped. The shade was gone. The third sun was reaching long rays under the rock to sear his already burned flesh. He had to find more shade. Movements were very painful. His lips were cracking and his face had blackened. The injured knee had swollen inside the protective suit. It throbbed and ached. Dazedly he pulled himself to his feet. On the rock beside him spread an inch thick was the almost invisible creature he had been forced to circle in order to stop the liquid scorpion. He wondered tiredly if it was dangerous. It lay completely motionless, just as it had when the liquid scorpion had approached. So it was probably more afraid of him than he was of it. He turned away. There appeared to be shade down the valley, perhaps a mile, perhaps three too much for him, he knew, but he set out, feeling the sun beat cruelly at him, crying out when the pain in his knee forced him to catch his balance against the sun-heated rock. He knew without turning that the liquid creature was following him, stopping when he stopped, starting when he started. When he knew he could go no farther, and felt his knee give weakly to his weight, he saw it ooze forward and began to flow over his legs. He tried to reach his pistol, but it seemed so far away. Zen, following the stinkiller, curiously, put together all that he had learned. This creature was different from himself. It needed shade. It had killed his enemy, which was possibly also its own enemy. Now it was trying to reach the shade, but its progress grew steadily slower. He considered that progress. The only thing he could liken it to was one of his own kind, caught out in the time of cold, trying to reach the heat-retaining sands, slowly congealing into a solid mass and dying. This, then, was a reverse process. 
Perhaps the sting-killer would become liquid after a certain degree of heat. Zen's sense of knowing warned him gently about too much wandering in the open, where countless stings could be hiding. He drew back, unwilling to stop following this interesting creature. The sting-killer vibrated the ground and lay still suddenly. Zen waited for a sense of death, but none came. This might be, for the new thing, a stage similar to that when one of Zen's own kind became unable to move from the cold, but still lived and feared. Caught between his own fear and a very strange sensation that he could not interpret, Zen waited a degree of heat. Then he oozed forward and spread himself over the still shape until it floated within him. When he flowed over one part, the thing struggled pitiably. Zen drew back startledly, and the movement ceased. Carefully, he retraced his course, leaving the part free. This time there was no struggling. Spurred by fear of stings, Zen began to flow across the land, letting his sense guide him to the coldness. He slithered up slopes, poured over steep drops, always collecting himself in time to catch his burden. He found a place that would stay cold until the next time of heat, and halted in front of it, his anxiety evident in the way he spread and collected himself back and forth. At last he inched forward, feeling the agony of the cold bite into every cell. Bunching himself behind the stillkiller, he made it flow along him until it broke free and lay upon the shaded rock. Zen drew back as hurriedly as his already sluggish mass would allow. He spread thin across the earth and let the heat liquefy his body again. It was when the time of cold was only a few degrees away that Zen felt the heavy vibration which nearly made him dissolve with fear. It lasted for a few degrees and then weakened and made only a small tremor. Now many smaller vibrations reached him, like many creatures moving about. The tremors spread out, moving slowly toward the rocky valley. Zen lay still, trying to identify the vibrations. They were not those of stings. As they approached, he recognized them as resembling in great numbers the creature he had put upon the rock. Kurt imagined he heard voices, an incoherent babble of them. He struggled to sit up but there was an incredible weight on his chest. "'Lie still,' a voice said clearly, and his mind echoed, "'Still, still, still.' He struggled again. "'Liquid,' he croaked painfully. "'Liquid animal, liquid.' The weight was still there. He heard one last voice say, "'Poor guy, he must have run into scorpions.' Then it was lifted, and it seemed as though the lifting would never cease. Zen waited until the small tremor was gone, and the great vibration had roared and disappeared. He knew by the sense of emptiness that the stinkiller had gone back to his own kind. For a moment he felt very alone, though he knew the sand was full of Zens. Slowly he drew himself together for the time of cold was but a few degrees away, and he must seek the warm sands. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past, and now for the next story. Reluctant Genius by Henry Slezar Writing as O. H. Leslie, originally published in Amazing Stories, January 1957. Narrated by Tom Trussell. It is said that life crawled up from the slime of the sea bottoms and became man because of inherent greatness spread into him before the dawn of time. But perhaps this urge was not as formless as we think. Buos was chastising Laloi as they sped through the ionosphere of the green planet. 
but like the airy creature she was, Leloy ignored the criticism and rippled Zephyr-like through a clump of daffodils when they completed their descent. So pretty, she sighed. She flung her incorporeal substance around each flower, absorbing their unified beauty of scent, sight, and feel. Buos shrilled himself into a column of wind to express his displeasure at her attitude. "'Stupid, silly, shallow thing,' he said, "'if the others only knew how you behaved.' "'And you'll be glad to tell them, of course,' she said, "'extending her fingers of air into the roots of the wind-bent grass. "'She rolled across the hill ecstatically, "'and Buos followed in grumbling billows of energy.' "'I don't carry tales,' he replied, somewhat mortified. "'But we're here as observers, and you insist upon making this world a plaything.' "'I love it,' she said happily. "'It's so warm and green.' Buos whipped in front of her angrily. "'This is an assignment,' he snapped, his emotion crackling the air about him. "'We have a purpose here.' "'Purpose!' she groaned settling over a patch of crowded clover. How many centuries will this assignment last? This world is young, said Buos. It will take time. But how long? she asked mournfully. Our world will be shriveled and dead before these people have the knowledge to rescue us. Why can't we spend our lives here? And leave the others behind, said Buos stiffly, selfish, being, he said sadly. This world cannot support one-fourth our number. Oh, I know, I know, Leloy said. I do not mean to say such things. I am twisted by my sorrow. As if to express her self-abnegation, she corkscrewed out of the clover and into a thin spiral of near nothingness. Settle down, foolish one, said Buos, not unkindly. I know your feelings. Do you think I am not tormented as well by the slow pace of these earth things, crude, barbaric beings like children with the building blocks of science? They have such a long way to go. And so if you know, said Leloy despairingly, a handful of seeing minds, tens of millions of ignorant ones, not even first principles, they're stupid, stupid, but they will learn, Buos said stubbornly. That is historical fact. Some day they will know the true meanings of matter and light and energy. Slowly, yes, slowly. But in terms of their growth it will seem like a great speed to them. And in terms of our world, said Leloy, spinning sadly over the ground, they may be far too late. No! In his excitement Buos forgot himself, and entwined with the flowing form of the she-creature, and the result was a rending of the air that cracked like heat-lightning over the field. No, he repeated again, they must not be too late, they must learn, they must build from the very ground, and then they must fly, then their eyes must be lifted to the stars, and desire must extend them to all the universe. It seems so hopeless. It cannot be. Our destiny is not extinction. They must come to us in fleets of silver and replant our soil and send towers of green shooting into our sky, breathing out air. Yes, yes, Leloy cried pitifully. It will be that way, Buos. It will be that way. That man-creature will begin with him. Buos floated earthward disconsolately. He is a dreamer, he said cheerlessly. His mind is good. He thinks of tomorrow. He is one of the knowing ones. But he cannot be moved, Leloy. His thoughts may fester and die in the prison of his brain. No, they will not. We have watched him. He understands much. He will help us. I have seen his like before, said Buos hopelessly. He thinks and he works, and his conclusions will die stillborn, for lack of a moving force. Then let us provide it, Buos, let us move him. With what, said the other disdainfully, arms of nothing, hands of vacuum, a breeze against his cheek, 
a rustle in leaves, a meaningless whistle in his ear. Let us try, let us try. This empty watchfulness is destroying us. Let us move him, Buos, come. Faster than the sky-sweeping clouds they flew, over the gently swelling hills, over the yearning branches of the trees, over the calm blue waters of the lakes, swifter than the flight of birds they came, searching for a thinking mind. They found him at last. He knows, he knows, said Leloy, only now to say, this is so because, and this must happen when, only to think, to understand. They hovered over his head in a pandemonium of helplessness. They whirled and tumbled and shrilly circled, and then to Leloy the inspiration came. The apple, caught by a sudden gust of wind, twisted from the tenuous hold of the tree and fell to the ground. The man, startled, picked it up. He gazed at it, deep in thought. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. Shandy by Ron Goulart Originally published in Worlds of If, October 1958 Narrated by Tom Trissel Holman came down out of the forest of giant orange woods and trudged across the plain toward the place where Nancy Tanner lived. It was late afternoon, and the woods beyond Nancy's home were already growing dark and dim. The door of the old spaceship was open, and a dark flowered rug hung over the rail of the gangway. Late sun glazed the round window near the door but Holman thought he had seen Nancy behind the strawberry patterned curtains. Wearing a pale blue cotton dress, tan and slender, Nancy came out of the ship and into the low-trimmed grass. She held up one arm and waved once, smiling. Ken, she said, and turned to roll up the rug. Holman said, How you been? as he came near, walking at his usual pace. Setting the rug carefully on the bottom step, Nancy looked up at him. Fine? Yourself? Not bad. Had a cold last week. Holman put his suitcase down next to the neatly rolled rug. Nancy frowned. You still don't eat enough greens, that's why. Holman kissed her, his hands gentle on her back. Well, here I am, he said. Well, come in and we'll talk. She stepped slowly away from him and went up into the ship. Holman gathered up his suitcase and the rolled rug and followed her. He looked in and all around the kitchen before he entered. Nancy watched him over her shoulder while she got two china cups. She grinned at him as he stepped into the room. I left the rug in my grip in the hall, Holman said, and sat down in a straight-backed chair. Stooping to retie his hiking shoes, he glanced under the table. Made it from the settlement in under four hours. Of course, I took big steps. Would you like rum or whiskey or something like that in your coffee? Nancy asked, touching the handle of the coffee pot. School teachers don't drink before sundown. You're on vacation. I'll wait. You go ahead, though. Nancy set a cup in front of him and backed away. You really have a tent in that little suitcase? You're not trying to get me to put you up here? It's one of those monofilm ones. He pulled the cup closer to him and it rattled in the saucer. I told you my intentions in my letter. And you said OK. So here I am to court you. Holman started to rise. Nancy nodded him down. I suppose it'll be all right. I don't know. She went back to the stove. Holman stood and started toward Nancy. He was distracted by a clicking sound in the hallway outside. As he turned to the entranceway, a large tan lion came in, its black-tipped tail swishing slowly. Holman stopped as the lion crossed the kitchen between him and Nancy. Don't panic, Nancy, he said in a calm voice. 
If nobody moves, it'll go away. Nancy smiled. Why should it go away? It's only Shandy. The lion nuzzled his head over the backs of Nancy's knees and made a growling, purring sound. The tip of his tail flipped against the smooth white stove. Holman frowned at the lion and dropped back into his chair. Shandy, the last time I saw him he was a St. Barnard dog. Nancy rumpled the lion's mane. Well, you know how Shandy is. He doesn't stay one thing for long. He saw a picture of a lion on a sack of meal last week and off he went. When you're through fondling him, I'd like my coffee. And where's the rum? Gently pushing the leaning lion away from her legs, Nancy said, I'll get it, Ken. She patted Shandy on the back. Go outside and play, Shandy. That's a nice boy. Without looking at Holman, the lion left the kitchen. That's ridiculous, Holman said, turning from the empty doorway. Damn it, Ken, he's my pet and I like him. The rum bottle made a hard, flat sound as she put it in front of Holman. You might try to accept him. He's a very nice pet. Holman unscrewed the bottle cap. Love me, love my whatever the hell he is. For somebody who came by to court me, you're not being very pleasant. She poured out two cups of coffee. Looking at the red bottle cap, Holman said, OK, I'm sorry. You know, Shandy's been with me since I was just ten or so, and since Dad died, Shandy's been a real help. You don't have to live out here. Holman poured some rum into his coffee, just because your father was a naturalist and all. We don't have to talk about my father. I like living here. We've always lived here, since we came out to Enoch. All right. He paused to look across the table at her. You want to keep arguing, or will you let me propose now? Nancy shook her head. Don't now, Ken. Later some time. You do know, though, that I want you, and you know I want you with me at the settlement. Nancy folded her hands on the white tablecloth. Oh, yes. Holman drank the hot coffee fast. And really, Nancy, I don't see how we could keep something like Shandy in the settlement. Come and have dinner with me tonight, and we'll talk then. Putting down his empty cup, Holman said, I'll go set up my tent at a safe distance. Outside, it was nearly night. A few yards from the ship, the lion was rolling on his back in a patch of yellow flowers and growling to himself. Holman kept his back to the lion while he assembled his tent. And when he had finished, he went inside and didn't come out until Nancy called him for dinner. The sky, up through the yellow-green leaves, was clear. The afternoon was warm, with a slight feel of coming rain. Holman locked his hands behind his head and half closed his eyes. And living alone by the woods is dangerous, he said. Nancy laughed. You've just eaten lunch in it. Holman closed his eyes. And how do you know what Shandy is? Maybe he's why this place got a bad name in the first place. He's a harmless pet. I'm very fond of him. Didn't your father have any ideas about him? Dad couldn't figure Shandy out. He made all kinds of tests. Shandy's the only one of his kind we ever saw. But, see, Dad wasn't sure what he was originally. He's a mimic, an overdone chameleon. I don't know. I like him. Sitting up, Holman said, OK. He touched Nancy's shoulder. Look, we've known each other, what, over a year now? Since you made that ridiculous field trip with your pupils and trampled all over everything. She tucked her legs under her and leaned toward him. Yeah, so let's not argue or anything. But really, Nancy, I would sort of like to marry you. I know. Have you any idea if you're nearing a decision? Oh, yes. And? Well, I think we can. Marry? Uh-huh. Fine. After he'd kissed Nancy, Holman became aware of a shambling off in the trees beyond the picnic spot. 
twigs crackled, and a medium-sized gorilla crashed into the open. Holman let go of Nancy and asked her, Shandy? The gorilla was carrying a large book in one paw. Yes, Nancy said, smiling. He's been nosing through the storeroom again. Must have been in one of my old picture books. The gorilla came up near their picnic basket and held out the book. He wants me to read to him, Ken. He gets that way now and then. Nancy took the book and opened it to the title page. Earth Fairy Tales. This is one of your favourites, huh, Shandy? Bobbing his gorilla head, Shandy squatted down among the fallen leaves and smacked his paws together. Is he intelligent? Ken asked incredulously. His scalp began to crawl. Oh, no. Well, let's start at the very beginning again, Nancy said. Shandy rested his head on one clenched paw. Once upon a time, Nancy started. Holman stood and grabbed up his windbreaker. I've heard this one before. I'll drop by your place in the evening. Be finished by then? Nancy half closed the book with a finger as a marker. You're angry? His coat seemed jammed, and Holman decided to wear the coat open. No. He walked away into the woods. He was only a few steps into the trees when Nancy started the story again. The fire flared up, brightening the ground around Holman's tent. Nancy hugged her knees up close to her and rested her head on them. He would be out of place at the settlement, she said. Holman dropped a log on the campfire and came back to sit beside the girl. He'd probably be happier running around out here in the woods. Nancy nodded slowly. Probably. The stairs out of the old ship rattled once off in the darkness. Holman looked away from the fire and toward the ship. Coming across the grass toward them was a giant teddy bear. Laughing, Nancy rose. It's Shandy. She glanced at Holman. Be nice to him. Holman watched Shandy approach and didn't answer. The teddy bear sat down like a dropped rag doll next to Nancy. He rubbed his fuzzy brown paws over his black nose and blinked his button eyes at her. Nice old Shandy, said Nancy, pulling one of Shandy's round ears. She smiled at Holman. This is what he was being when Dad and I first found him. Holman, tilting forward, flipped a flat stone into the fire and scattered sparks. That's a coincidence. I was just, you know, about ten, Nancy said, patting Shandy's head. What had happened was I'd been playing in the woods, and anyway, I left my own teddy bear out there, lost it, and I told Dad because it was almost night when I remembered. Well, he found it, and right beside it there was a big old Shandy. Dad and I both decided after looking at him for a while that his name should be Shandy. Shandy blinked his eyes and clapped his paws. Holman's left heel jammed hard against the ground as he shot up. God damn, Nancy, will you knock off all this maudlin, banal boy and his dog stuff? We're not taking that monster away anywhere. I know, I know, Ken. Don't talk about it now. She kept patting the teddy bear gently. Nice, Shandy. And you, Shandy, Holman shouted. I'm doing the courting around here. Go hibernate or something, damn it. Shandy's eyes stopped blinking. Nancy's hand slipped from his head and trailed down his woolly back as he rolled over and away. Without turning, Shandy started off for the ship, slowly on all fours. Finally, Nancy looked at Holman. That wasn't nice, Ken. Holman knew that. He could find nothing to say back to Nancy. He frowned and went into his tent, slamming the flap behind him. After closing the storeroom door, Holman carried the two old suitcases down the bright corridor to Nancy's kitchen. Nancy smiled at him, and then at the brown, scuffed luggage. Oh, sure, those will do, she said. I guess the movers will be able to take care of the heavy stuff. Holman agreed, and picked up his half-finished cup of coffee. 
and we can leave lots of the stuff here. If we're going to use this as a sort of a summer place, I don't think we'll have to worry about vandals. From the doorway, Nancy said, Not many girls bring a spaceship as a dowry. Holman took her shoulders and turned her back into the room. We can make Shandy sort of a watchdog. If he ever comes back. It's only a little more than a day he's been gone. You are unkind to him. I know. I'm sorry. Nancy edged around him and went to stand by the stove. More coffee? OK. Holman was halfway to her when the knock sounded on the spaceship door. Maybe it's Shandy, Nancy said, partly surprised, partly relieved. Maybe. I'll get it. When Holman opened the door, a tall, slender young man, wearing a conservative suit, stepped out of the darkness and into the light of the corridor. He had a neat black moustache and was carrying a big bunch of red and gold forest flowers. Is Miss Nancy at home? Who are you? The young man was standing close to him, but Holman didn't move back. The young man bowed slightly and smiled. Tell Miss Nancy, it's Shandy, or better, Mr. Shandy. Christ, said Holman, backing now. Shandy bowed again politely and walked to the door of the kitchen, knocking on the wall before he entered. Holman jerked himself together when he heard Nancy gasp and ran back to her. Shandy was sitting in a kitchen chair, his legs crossed. "'It's a rather interesting story, Miss Nancy,' he said, smiling evenly. Nancy reached out and turned off the stove. "'I imagine.' Shandy brushed each side of his moustache. "'Well, to begin, then, I was in the wood, and suddenly I tripped, carelessly, over a fallen log, and was knocked unconscious. When I recovered, I found myself in this state.' He paused to rub his head. "'And, of course, I remembered.' Looking straight at him, Nancy said, You'd had amnesia. Yes, you see, Miss Nancy, many years ago, I'm not sure how many, my people lived here, and I was quite a prominent member of the ruling class. But I incurred, unfortunately, the wrath of an evil scientist. And? asked Holman. For somebody who'd recently been a teddy bear, Shandy looked pretty dapper. Shandy smiled. She put a spell on me which caused me to change shape, and also made me forget what I had originally been. Nancy laughed softly. Well, it's good to have you back. With a faint flourish, Shandy held out the wild flowers. For you, Miss Nancy. Why, thank you, Shandy. Holman leans against the wall under the clock and eyed Shandy. "'You back to stay?' "'Well,' Shandy said, "'I've known Miss Nancy quite a while, "'and I'm really quite fond of her. "'I hate to see her go.' "'He looked at the flowers Nancy held against her chest. "'I have come to ask Miss Nancy to allow me to court her, "'with all due respects to Mr. Holman.' "'Damn it to hell!' Holman said, straightening. "'Nancy placed the flowers on the table and smiled at Shandy.' He stood as she approached him. Nancy laughed and put her arms around the young man. With her head against Shandy's chest, Nancy said, Poor Shandy! Poor Shandy! She made him sit down again. Then she patted him fondly on the head. Stay right there, Shandy! Nancy hurried from the room. Holman followed her. Listen, are you sure he isn't intelligent? "'Because, my God, the scientist down at the settlement!' "'Nancy said, "'Oh, no, Ken, he just copies things he's heard people say. "'Wait a minute.' "'She disappeared into the storeroom. "'When she returned, she was holding a dusty album in her hand. "'Holman followed her back into the kitchen. "'Shandy looked at the album for a moment, and then smiled. "'I meant well,' he said. "'I knew I recognised you,' Nancy said, turning a third through the book. My uncle Maxwell, when he graduated from Mars Yale. She slid the picture out and held it toward Holman, but he didn't take it. Shandy said, 
hated to see you go. Come to think of it, Holman thought, he does just repeat things people are always saying. Setting the book beside the flowers, Nancy said, What are you really, Shandy? I've never had a chance to talk to you before, except in a one-sided sort of way. Shandy folded his hands and uncrossed his legs. I don't remember just now, Miss Nancy. I used to know. I don't think there are many of us left now. He touched his moustache again, smoothing it. Maybe in the mountains there are some more. I don't remember. Nancy patted his head. I'm going to marry Ken, Shandy, and live in the settlement. You'll enjoy that. You think you'll stay this way? Holman asked. I might. I don't know. Holman held out his hand to Shandy. Anyway, we want you to stay here and keep watch over things. Shandy hesitated and then shook hands. I might as well. Holman and Nancy left for the settlement the next morning with their suitcases. Shandy, still in the shape of Uncle Maxwell, they left on the front steps of the ship. He waved goodbye to them. When they were gone, he changed slowly into a large teddy bear. Then, with a moist gleam in his eye, he went back to reading the thick red leather picture encyclopedia in his lap. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. Lonesome Hearts by R. R. Winterbotham Writing as Russ Winterbotham Originally published in If Worlds of Science Fiction, July 1954. Narrated by Tom Trusser. It seems unnecessary to say that my story began a long time ago, but I do not intend to be subtle. I am not clever, and my lying is unpolished, almost amateurish. So I certainly could not be subtle, which requires both cleverness and an ability to tell the truth and a lie in the same breath. Let us turn back the clock a few ages. I was lying in the sun, thinking of love. I understand that you human beings have an aversion to biological discussion, so I will not go into detail. But I must remind you that my love life is quite different from yours, for I am from another planet. At the time under discussion, I was most deeply in love. My heart's desire had no shape, the lovely creature. She had no intelligence, the divine soul. But she was the greatest bit of protoplasm in any galaxy you could name. By our standards, I probably might be called handsome. I was young and healthy. I had all of my genes and chromosomes. My colour was a dirty green that is associated with beauty. The sun warmed my body, and the tidal undulation of my planet's surface rocked me gently. And then she came into my life. She floated gently in the breeze, her dainty figure held aloft by a mere hint of levitation. Sparks of static electricity shot from a tender cilia so brightly that I forced to exude a layer of protective fibre to protect my visual buds. She sucked a deep breath of cyanic gas into her pulmonary pouch and spoke to me sweetly with a voice like distant thunder. My dear Iljim, the world is coming to an end. I could not believe her, for she had no intelligence. She only loved to talk. Perhaps, I said, but not today. Very soon, then, said she. Her name was Mjilly. I watched her with patronising amusement. The static electricity showed that she was nervous and upset, but people often get nervous and upset over trivial matters. Now how, I reasoned, could our world come to an end? The other planet has gone on for thousands of years without colliding with us. We circle it, in fact. No, Mjilly said, that is not our doom. Actually, our world will not cease to exist. 
Life will end here, that is all. Ah, I said, our atmosphere is escaping into space. I sucked air viciously. True, the air was thin. True, the atmosphere was escaping. But there would be breathable amounts for many thousands of centuries yet to come. Not the air. The food is all gone. Things we eat have ceased to exist. I levitated myself and looked out over the throbbing land. A few years ago, this land had been covered with vegetation. I had come to take vegetation so much for granted that I had ceased to notice it. Now it was gone. There were no round fruits growing from tender grasses, no tubers dangling from the fungus trees, no legume vines sprawling over the rocks. Everywhere lay desert, barren dunes shaking their crests with tidal motion. I lowered myself to the ground and dug my big fibrocytes into the sod. No green leaves grew there beneath the surface. The soil was dead. This will seriously interfere with our future, Mjilly, I said. We might eat each other, she replied, but then there would be no one left. No one? There are many others here. The others are dying, said Mjilly, blinking her otic nerves eerily. We soon will be the only ones left. It was indeed a senseless thing to do to die just because there was no means of going on living. But I must admit, I was tempted for a moment. But I hung on to myself, for there was a Mjilly, and as long as she lived, there was a reason for me to live too. It's not a cheerful prospect, I said, but I suppose death by starvation is the best way out. We will face death as we have lived, cheerfully and fortuitously. "'And why should we die when there is another world so close?' she asked. "'Are you suggesting interplanetary flight, my dear?' I was amused again, even though there was little enough left to be amused at. She crinkled her sense to smell in reply, and I realised I was not being amused at the right time. Anchoring herself for magnetic processes, she began to weave the atmosphere delicately with her taste bud tendrils. Quickly she hollowed the air molecules into a reflective mirror and brought it to focus on our neighbouring world. I levitated myself into a position so that I could look into the mirror. The near planet was quite satisfactory. It was the one you know as the Earth. It was young. It was green. Huge fern-like plants grew abundantly on its surface. It was full of food. And near. The trip could be made by levitation, Mjelly said. I hung back. Animals might live there. We'd be devoured. I'm not afraid, she said. We might not get hungry for a time. Let us linger here a while. Later, when we get desperate, there'll be time enough for interplanetary flight. I hated the thought of stuffing myself full of air enough to last for the long trip. Mjilly lowered her visual buds. I'm going to become a mother, she said. Go then, and become a mother. I'll stay here till I get hungry, and then join you. Jilly unflexed her sense of touch, and I felt sorry for her. If I could be sure, I said, that no wild animals live on the earth, I'd go sooner. She snapped her sense of balance in happiness. I will go first, said she. If everything is pleasant and safe, I will return and let you know. I nodded my otic nerves, and off she went. As you human beings are doubtless aware, space levitation is quite complicated, but not beyond accomplishment. Once you are able to reach the speed of escape, the rest is easy. But Mjilly was young and strong, and soon she had disappeared from sight, travelling at a tremendous velocity. I followed her as long as I could with the telescope, and then I lowered myself to the tidal crest of a nearby sand dune and lost myself in metaphysical thoughts. Almost half a year later, I realised that Mjilly had been gone longer than I expected. Either she had been eaten by wild animals on the earth, 
or she had forgotten me. I was beginning to get lonesome, and in a few more months I would get hungry. At the thought of enduring two such excruciating pains at the single time, I decided to risk my life. I would travel through space to the earth and try to find my beloved. As you may have guessed, the planet on which we had been living is the one you know as the moon, and the distance to the earth is comparatively small. The sand dunes now have hardened, and the tidal sway of its surface can be felt only slightly. The moon no longer turns on its axis, and it has no sweetly scented cyanide in its atmosphere. It has no atmosphere of any sort, but it stands now as it did when I left it, glorious in death. Since I departed, no living thing has trod its soil. My scientific sense instinctively came to the rescue as I approached the earth. I felt a strong gravity wrenching at my vitals, and so instead of trying reverse levitation, I spread my processes so that the atmosphere caught in the folds of my skin, and I came floating gently down to the ground without harm. The earth was much as it had appeared through the molecule telescope. It was covered with green vegetation, good, rich, nourishing stuff, and there was enough to feed Mijili and me for a million years. There were no animals of any sort. Again I went to my scientific sense for the answer. I realised that while vegetable life was far advanced, animal life had yet to appear. Mjili was the first of this type of life ever to set foot on terrestrial soil. But where was she? On the moon I could often locate her a thousand miles away by a simple radio call. Although the earth was much larger than the moon, I did not doubt that it was within a thousand miles. So I generated power and issued a call. I waited for the response. It came feebly to my antenna. Using my sense of direction, I pushed through the vegetation in search of her. I did not levitate, because the feebleness of her call indicated she might be hurt and on the ground. Besides, levitation is much more difficult on the earth than on the moon. The reply came stronger to my next call, and I sensed through seven of my senses that she was near. She was on the ground, probably injured, which explained why she had not returned as she had promised. I came to a patch of wilderness, a great marshy plain. In the middle of this swamp was a crater, like those caused by meteors, a deep, ugly scar in the mud. I shuddered at the thought that my darling Umjeli might have landed there. Her weaker scientific sense might not have given her the cue to use her skin as a parachute, and she might have made the fatal mistake of trying to reverse levitate. "'Mjili!' I called, speaking aloud now. "'Mjili, where are you?' "'Iljim, I'm here!' Yes, the voice came from the crater. Gliding to its rim, I looked down. A pool of water lay on the bottom. A greenish scum covered the surface. The scum moved with a million tiny wriggles. Yes, Iljim, came Majili's voice. It is I, but I am no longer one being. And her voice sounded like a million tiny chirps joined together. I landed with such force that I came apart. Now each of my body cells lives a life of its own. And now and then each cell grows fat and becomes two. I am my sisters. I... Let's not be subtle about it. Mjili was a microbe, the beginning of animal life on the earth. She lives today. She is and always will be her sisters, her mothers, herselves, and her ancestors. But there are few ancestors, for microbes do not die. Just part of themselves die. And I do not die, for I crept away into a hole in the ground, where I will live forever. I do not starve, for roots reach me here, but I miss my love with life with Mijili. I can never be a mother or a sister. I will always be me, a lonesome old Bem. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. 
All Cats Are Grey by Andre Norton Writing as Andrew North Originally published in Fantastic Universe Science Fiction, August 1953 Narrated by Tom Trissel Under normal conditions, a whole person has a decided advantage over a handicapped one. But out in deep space, the normal may be reversed, for humans at any rate. Stina of the Space Waves That sounds just like a corner title for one of the Stella Vido spreads. I ought to know. I've tried my hand at writing enough of them. Only this Stina was no glamour babe. She was as colourless as a lunar plant. Even the hair netted down to her skull had a short of greyish cast, and I never saw her but once draped in anything but a shapeless and baggy grey space all. Stina was strictly background stuff, and that is where she mostly spent her free hours, in the smelly, smoky background corners of any stellar port dive frequented by free spaces. If you really looked for her, you could spot her, just sitting there listening to the talk, listening and remembering. She didn't open her own mouth often, but when she did, spaces had learned to listen, and the lucky few who heard her rare spoken words, these will never forget Stina. She drifted from port to port. Being an expert operator on the big calculators, she found jobs wherever she cared to stay for a time. And she came to be something like the master-minded machines she tended, smooth, grey, without much personality of her own. But it was Stina who told Bub Nelson about the Joven moon rites, and a warning saved Bub's life six months later. It was Stina who identified the piece of stone Keen Clark was passing around a table one night, rightly calling it unworked slitite. That started a rush which made ten fortunes overnight for men who were down on their last jets. And last of all, she cracked the case of the Empress of Mars. All the boys who had profited by her queer store of knowledge and a photographic memory tried at one time or another to balance the scales but she wouldn't take so much as a cup of canal water at their expense, let alone the credits they tried to push on her. Bub Nelson was the only one who got around her refusal. It was he who brought her bat. About a year after the Joven affair, he walked into the free fall one night and dumped bat down on a table. Bat looked at Stina and growled. She looked calmly back at him and nodded once. From then on, they travelled together the thin grey woman and the big grey tomcat. Pat learned to know the inside of more stellar bars than even most spacers visit in their lifetime. He developed a liking for vernal juice, drank it neat and quick, right out of a glass, and he was always at home on any table where Stina elected to drop him. This is really the story of Stina, Bat, Cliff Moran and the Empress of Mars, a story which is already a legend of the spaceways, and it's a damn good story too. I ought to know, having framed the first version of it myself. For I was there, right in the Rigel Royal, when it all began on the night that Cliff Moran blew in, looking lower than an Ant-Man's belly and twice as nasty. He'd had a spell of luck foul enough to twist a man into a slug snake, and we all knew that there was an attachment out for his ship. Cliff had fought his way up from the back courts of Vienaport, Lose his ship and he'd slip back there, to rot. He was at the snarling stage that night when he picked out a table for himself and set out to drink away his troubles. However, just as the first bottle arrived, so did a visitor. Stina came out of her corner, bat curled around her shoulders, stolewise, his favourite mode of travel. She crossed over and dropped down without invitation at Cliff's side. That shook him out of his sulks because Stina never chose company when she could be alone. If one of the manstones of Ganymede had come stumping in, it wouldn't have made more of us look out of the corners of her eyes. She stretched out one long-fingered hand and set aside the bottle he had ordered and said only one thing. It's about time for the Empress of Mars to appear again. Cliff scowled and bit his lip. He was tough, tough as jetlining. You have to be granite inside and out to struggle up from Vienaport to a ship command. 
but we could guess what was running through his mind at that moment. The Empress of Mars was just about the biggest prize a spacer could aim for. But in the fifty years she had been following her queer derelict orbit of through space, many men had tried to bring her in. And none had succeeded. A pleasure ship carrying untold wealth, she had been mysteriously abandoned in space by passengers and crew, none of whom had ever been seen or heard of again. At intervals thereafter she had been sighted, even boarded. Those who ventured into her either vanished or returned swiftly without any believable explanation of what they had seen, wanting only to get away from her as quickly as possible. But the man who could bring her in, or even strip her clean in space, that man would win the jackpot. All right, Cliff slammed his fist down on the table. I'll try even that. Steena looked at him, much as he must have looked at Bat the day Bub Nelson brought him to her and nodded. That was all I saw. The rest of the story came to me in pieces, months later, and in another port half the system away. Cliff took off that night. He was afraid to risk waiting, with a writ out that could pull the ship from under him, and it wasn't until he was in space that he discovered his passengers, Steena and Bat. We'll never know what happened then. I'm betting that Steena made no explanation at all. She wouldn't. It was the first time she had decided to cash in on her own tip, and she was there. That was all. Maybe that point weighed with Cliff. Maybe he just didn't care. Anyway, the three were together when they sighted the Empress riding, her dead lights gleaming, a ghost ship in night space. She must have been an eerie sight, because her other lights were on too, in addition to the red warnings at her nose. She seemed alive, a flying Dutchman of space. Cliff worked his ship skillfully alongside and had no trouble in snapping magnetic lines to a lock. Some minutes later, the three of them passed into her. There was still air in her cabins and corridors, air that bore a faint, corrupt taint which set Bat to sniffing greedily and could be picked up even by the less sensitive human nostrils. Cliff headed straight for the control cabin, but Steena and Bat went prowling. Closed doors were a challenge to both of them, and Steena opened each as she passed, taking a quick look at what lay within. The fifth door opened on a room which no woman could leave without further investigation. I don't know who had been housed there when the Empress left port on a last lengthy cruise. Anyone really curious can check back on the old photo reg cards. But there was a lavish display of silks trailing out of two travel kits on the floor, a dressing table crowded with crystal and jewelled containers, along with other lures for the female which drew Stina in. She was standing in front of the dressing table when she glanced into the mirror, glanced into it and froze. Over her right shoulder she could see the spider silk cover on the bed. Right in the middle of that sheer gossamer expanse was a sparkling heap of gems, the dumped contents of some jewel case. Bat had jumped to the foot of the bed and flattened out as cats will, watching those gems, watching them, and something else. Stina put out her hand blindly and caught up the nearest bottle. As she unstoppered it, she watched the mirrored bed. A gemmed bracelet rose from the pile, rose in the air and tinkled its siren song. It was as if an idle hand played. Bat spat almost noiselessly, but it did not retreat. Bat had not yet decided his course. She put down the bottle. Then she did something which perhaps few of the men she had listened to through the years could have done. She moved without hurry or sign of disturbance on a tour about the room. And although she approached the bed, she did not touch the jewels. She could not force herself to that. It took her five minutes to play out her innocence and unconcern. Then it was Bat who decided the issue. He leapt from the bed and escorted something to the door remaining a careful distance behind, and he mewed loudly twice. Stina followed him and opened the door wider. Bat went straight on down the corridor, as intent as a hound on the warmest of scents. Stina strolled behind him, holding her place to the unhurried gate of an explorer. 
What sped before them both was invisible to her, but Bat was never baffled by it. They must have gone into the control cabin almost on the heels of the Unseen. If the Unseen had heels, which there was good reason to doubt, for Bat crouched just within the doorway and refused to move on. Stina looked down the length of the instrument panels and officers' station seats to where Cliff Moran worked. On the heavy carpet her boots made no sound, and he did not glance up but sat humming through set teeth as he tested their tardy and reluctant responses to buttons which had not been pushed in years. To human eyes they were alone in the cabin, but Bat still followed a moving something with his gaze, and it was something which he had had at last made up his mind to distrust and dislike, for now he took a step or two forward and spat, his loathing made plain by every raised hair along his spine. And in that same moment Stina saw a flicker, a flicker of vague outline against Cliff's hunched shoulders as if the Invisible One had crossed the space between them. But why had it been revealed against Cliff and not against the back of one of the seats or against the panels, the walls of the corridor or the cover of the bed where it had reclined and played with its loot? What could Bat see? The storehouse memory that had served Stina so well throughout the years clicked open a half-forgotten door. With one swift motion she tore loose her space all and flung the baggy garment across the back of the nearest seat. Bat was snarling now, emitting the throaty rising cry that was his hunting song. But he was edging back, back towards Stina's feet, shrinking from something he could not fight, but which he faced defiantly, if he could draw it after him, past that dangling space hall, he had to. It was their only chance. What the? Cliff had come out of his seat and was staring at them. What he saw must have been weird enough. Stina, bare-armed and shouldered, her usually stiffly netted hair falling wildly down her back, Stina watching empty space with narrowed eyes and set mouth, calculating a single wild chance. Bat crouched on his belly, retreating from thin air step by step and wailing like a demon. "'Toss me your blaster!' Stina gave the order calmly, as if they still sat at their table in the Rigel Royal. And as quietly, Cliff obeyed. She caught the small weapon out of the air with a steady hand, caught and levelled it. "'Stay just where you are!' she warned. "'Back, Bat, bring it back!' With a last throat-splitting screech of rage and hate, Bat twisted to safety between her boots. She pressed with thumb and forefinger, firing at the space holes. The material turned to powdery flakes of ash, except for certain bits which still flapped from the scorched seat, as if something had protected them from the force of the blast. Bat sprang straight up in the air with a scream that tore their ears. What? began Cliff again. Stina made a warning motion with her left hand. Wait! She was still tense, still watching Bat. The cat dashed madly around the cabin twice, running crazily with the white-ringed eyes and flecks of foam on his muzzle. Then he stopped abruptly in the doorway, stopped and looked back over his shoulder for a long, silent moment. He sniffed delicately. Stina and Cliff could smell it too now, a thick, oily stench, it was not the usual odour left by an exploding blaster shell. Bat came back, treading daintily across the carpet, almost on the tips of his paws. He raised his head as he passed Stina, and then he went confidently beyond to sniff, to sniff and spit twice at the unburned strips of the space hall. Having thus paid his respects to the late enemy, he sat down calmly and set to washing his fur with deliberation. Stina sighed once and dropped into the navigator's seat. "'Maybe now you'll tell me what in the hell happened?' Cliff exploded as he took the blaster out of her hand. "Gray," she said dazedly. "'It must have been grey, or I couldn't have seen it like that. I'm colour-blind, you see. I can see only shades of grey. My whole world is grey. Like bats. His world is grey too. All grey.' but he's been compensated for. He can see above and below our range of colour vibrations, and, apparently, so can I. Her voice quavered, and she raised her chin with a new air Cliff had never seen before, a sort of proud acceptance. She pushed back her wandering hair, but she made no move to imprison it under the heavy net again. 
That is why I saw the thing when it crossed between us. Against your space all it was another shade of grey, an outline. So I put out mine and waited for it to show against that. It was our only chance, Cliff. It was curious at first, I think, and it knew we couldn't see it, which is why it waited to attack. But when Bat's actions gave it away, it moved. So I waited to see that flicker against the space all, and then I let him have it. It's really very simple. Cliff laughed a bit shakily. But what was this grey thing? I don't get it. I think it was what made the Empress a derelict. Something out of space, maybe, or from another world somewhere. She waved her hands. It's invisible because it's a colour beyond our range of sight. It must have stayed in here all these years, and it kills, it must, when its curiosity is satisfied. Swiftly she described the scene in the cabin, and with a strange behaviour of the gem pile which had betrayed the creature to her. Cliff did not return his blaster to his holster. Any more of them on board, do you think? He didn't look pleased at the prospect. Stina turned to Bat. He was paying particular attention to the space between two front toes in the process of a complete bath. I don't think so, but Bat will tell us if there are. He can see them clearly, I believe. But there weren't any more, and two weeks later, Cliff, Stina and Bat brought the Empress into the lunar quarantine station. And that is the end of Stina's story, because, as we have been told, happy marriages need no chronicles. And Stina had found someone who knew of her grey world and did not find it too hard to share with her, someone besides Bat. It turned out to be a real love match. The last time I saw her, she was wrapped in a flame-red cloak from the looms of Rigel and wore a fortune in Joven rubies blazing on her wrists. Cliff was flipping a three-figure credit bill to a waiter, and Bat had a row of vernal juice glasses set up before him. Just a little family party out on the town. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. I mean, why not? It's free. It's just a little click.